a big step towards opening the doors on just the second hotel in Arlington, catering in a pandemic. And they may be closed, but the town's beloved libraries continue to serve their patrons, and in some ways, maybe even better than before. These stories and more, up next. From McLennan Park to Spy Pond, from Poets Corner to the Mystic River, we have Arlington covered. We're your neighbors, a friend you can turn to. This is ACMI News. Hello, welcome to ACMI News. I'm James Milan. As you're well aware, Arlington is primarily a residential community with most of the commercial action in town confined to the Mass Ave corridor. Well, get ready to welcome a sight we haven't seen west of our border with Cambridge in living memory, a new hotel. The Lexington Hotel recently cleared a significant hurdle, and ACMI News correspondent Maxim Isaac is here to explain what that means. Once a place where you could come and fix your car would soon be a place where you could stay overnight. The Arlington Board approved a special permit to start constructing a new hotel right here at 1207 and 1211 Mass Ave. We'll run down the list. Ken. Aye. Rachel. Aye. David. Aye. Gene. Yes. And I vote yes. On August 17th, the Redevelopment Board voted unanimously to allow the Lexington Hotel to complete step one of the process after a year-long discussion. Rachel Zemberry, incoming chair of the board, explained the board's vote. The biggest factor was the developer's willingness to address all of the, the questions um, and concerns of the Redevelopment Board through the, through the year-long process. Uh, they spent a considerable amount of, of time and energy ensuring that, um, that, that questions and concerns were, were addressed, and it was their ability to ultimately address all of those, those questions that led to the unanimous decision. Once all steps are completed, the Lexington Hotel will be the first hotel in the Heights and the second hotel in Arlington after Homewood Suites that was opened in 2001. Zemberry goes on to explain the steps that remain before construction can begin. There, there are a few other, as you'll see in the decision that is posted on the Redevelopment Board site, um, there are a few items that the Redevelopment Board will, will review once the design, the working drawings are, are finalized in terms of the final materials and the actual signage uh, for the building. Um, but the, uh, the review process with the, with the, with the town, um, you know, there'll be a, a period of time where they're preparing the documents, then there'll be a, a period of, of review. They'll need to get the construction site mobilized and um, you know, there'll, there'll be a little bit of time before construction actually starts um, and then ultimately the project is open. The hotel will be located on the properties of 1207 and 1211 Mass Ave. The 48-room hotel will replace the Precision Tire and Alignment Shop. According to the developer, James Doherty, the hotel will include 24 parking spaces for both staff and overnight guests. One Arlingtonian has concerns about disability accommodations at the hotel and believes there's work to be done. There's no handicapped parking spaces there. There's no place at all for anybody with disabilities to even park a car themselves. It's valet only and it's restricted just to the hotel. The hotel does not have any um, rooms uh, for people with disabilities, what's called accessible rooms. Accessible rooms merely require that the pathways in the room between the bed and the wall and between furniture be 36 inches. From the plans he submitted so far, all the rooms have passageways of only 24 inches, not nearly enough for a wheelchair. And disability rooms for um, disabled people also means, or accessible rooms, means that you have to have bathrooms uh, with space wide enough. And it doesn't appear that they do. According to the developer's lawyer, Mary Winstanley O'Connor, an ADA compliant ramp will be installed as well as a detectable panel for pedestrians. She also asserts that the civil engineer has complied with the ADA. Developer Doherty believes that this hotel will bring tourists to Arlington to visit historic sites such as this one right here at the Oshram Mill. For additional information on the Lexington Hotel plan, you can find it on the ARB's webpage on the town's site. For ACMI News, I'm Max Isaac. The town has long been seeking ways to expand our commercial tax base, so hopefully this is a step in the right direction. 
Our local COVID-19 infection curve looks reassuringly flat going back a while now. In my conversation with town manager Adam Chapdelaine this week, I asked him to dig a little deeper into those numbers and tell us what facilities or areas of town or populations town officials are keeping a particularly close eye on. There is particular attention paid to making sure that daycare centers are safe and that there isn't, uh, you know, sort of a system spread there. Attention is certainly being paid to our senior living facilities to uh, avoid there being uh, another spread there as there was at the beginning of the pandemic. So I, I think where it leaves us is wanting to stay vigilant to prevent community spread. So there has been, you know, those few numbers and again, the, the younger age demographics over the past few weeks, which seem to have been spreading in the community. And I think we just want to continue to remind people to do everything they can to avoid that. Um, keep that mask on, keep your distance, try to stay outside, please don't have big parties, uh, you know, please don't have big gatherings, and go down the list. And, and I think we all understand that, you know, conducting ourselves in the manner that we're supposed to, we don't get risk down to zero, but we can get it down pretty low. And, and I think that's the point we want to just keep reiterating, that there's going to be certain institutional risks that might exist, and we try to manage those as best possible. Again, daycares, when school reopens, senior living facilities. There's, again, certain risks in just the operation of those institutions that we want to make sure either we're mitigating or the operators of those institutions are mitigating. But again, in general, we want to continue to push on, stay vigilant, keep your behavior the way it is because something's working, right? We're not, we're not getting community spread, but let's not get, um, you know, let, let's not get uh, sort of lulled into a false sense of security by that and keep doing what we're doing. Right. As you say, something's working and really it's kind of like everything in combination seems to be working. So let's keep, yeah. let's make sure that everything in combination continues. And let's call a spade a spade. I mean, I'm not a scientist and I don't claim to know that, uh, that this is actually the case, but it serves to reason that the good weather and the fact that people have been outside has helped us all out a lot, right? We're not in small rooms with potentially inadequate ventilation with other people very often these days. Come the fall and the winter, that's going to begin to change, or at least the temptation for that to change is going to begin. And I think that's where the vigilance is really going to have to kick in. That, you know, until there's a vaccine, until there's herd immunity, it's not going to be over. And getting back into small rooms with larger groups of people is, you know, that's where the risk is going to go through the roof. I also asked Adam about how he thought the recent primary election had gone, especially with a newly installed town clerk and a dramatically different voting process. It has been a lot of work on the part of the clerk's office and other departments that have been helping. Uh, the new clerk, Julie Brazil, has stepped right in um, and really provided uh, great leadership on the process. Um, the clerk staff has been working night and day. We've had the parking control officers who are not enforcing parking meters because they're shut down right now. They've been in working their full schedules, helping the clerk's office process ballot applications and ballots. We've had two librarians there full time uh, who we uh, set aside their library duties for the past several weeks and they've been working with the clerk's office. And then general government staff from my office, from the select board's office, I believe the treasurer's office has sent people upstairs, same for the assessors. It has been all hands on deck to process what has literally been thousands of vote by mail applications and to get those ballots back out. So it's been a lot of work. Um, there's been moments, you know, a couple weeks ago where not everybody was unsure how we were going to marshal the resources to get it done. But I think we're in good position now. The three ballot uh, drop-off boxes are out. Uh, they try to make it easier for people to get their ballots back. And hopefully we'll get through tomorrow with what will be the last election of our long-serving ballot machines, uh, voting machines, excuse me. So um, they, uh, you know, there, there were some uh, shutdowns or shutoffs in the the local election back in June. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to get through tomorrow and then get to the new machines in November. But all, all told, it's been, from my view, really an incredible effort by uh, a multiple, uh, sort of a multi-department effort to get this done and, and you know, maintain the democratic process. Yeah, that's, that, that is interesting. I did not realize that you were drawing folks from really a host of different departments to, uh, you know, I guess that's, that's the kind of thing, the kinds of flexible thinking and flexible deployment of resources that needs to happen. 
Yeah, I mean, we learned it in June, right, that the staffing of the clerk's office, they're just not, not staffed not. for this surge. Um, and it's a new thing, right? We have, we've never done vote by mail in such a large quantity. So yeah, they're not, they're not built for that surge capacity, but learned a little bit about it in June. It was a little more intense this time around. Um, but yeah, we, we pushed that surge capacity as best possible. And now I think we are very ready for November. Adam also shared his thoughts on the impending arrival in town of Blue Bikes and the new hotel. Spoiler alert, he's a big fan of both. To watch the full interview, just go to our ACMI News Facebook page. Operating in a pandemic poses particular challenges for the catering industry. As part of our series focusing on local businesses, ACMI News correspondent Anim Osmani reached out to Arlington's own Beaujolais Catering to see how they've been faring. Beaujolais Catering is one of many small businesses in the restaurant industry to get caught in the crosshairs of COVID-19 and to face some significant hardships. But despite the overbearing struggles, Beaujolais might just have a glimmer of hope that things will be okay. Beaujolais Catering is a full service catering company. Uh, we do weddings, bar mitzvahs, celebrations of all kinds, um, and sometimes bereavements. A once bustling full-fledged catering business went straight into a full stop. During the peak of the crisis on March 15th, Beaujolais closed its doors, donated its food inventory, and seized all operations, but had its first score last weekend. In order to keep the business afloat during the crisis, Michelle Noska had to put in money from her own savings account. My last event was March 15th, and my first event coming back was just last Saturday where I did a wedding. And then on Sunday I did a wedding, and um, it's coming back very slowly, but at least it's coming back a little bit. I've been doing proposals and responding to inquiries as they come in. Um, draining my savings account to pay for the rent uh, and utilities because I still have payroll income. Um, so the trash, the dumpsters, they're not getting emptied, but you still have to pay for them to sit there. And I have no staff and nobody on payroll, but you still have to pay taxes and you still have to keep that maintained. So there's always monthly charges even though they're reduced. Due to early savings and financial decisions, Michelle is getting back into the swing of things. On August 19th, Beaujolais posted an announcement on Facebook that they are now catering for events with 20 plus people or more. Aside from maintaining the strictest of codes and sanitary conditions, here are notable differences in her services. I now have all like little individual packaging and to do individual meals for deliveries for students who are coming back to campuses or if somebody has scaled down an important event like a wedding or a mitzvah. I can bring the food there and just drop it off for them. They'll all be individually wrapped if they have um, allergies or dietary restrictions. We can accommodate that, but each person will just get like a salad and a meal and a dessert and a drink. For ACMI News, I'm Anim Osmani. Kudos to Michelle for hanging in there. And let's hope that for Beaujolais' sake and that of other businesses, better days are coming. You know, few institutions are as dear to our community's heart as our libraries, and it's been a particularly painful effect of the pandemic that their doors have been closed for almost six months now. Take heart, however. I recently spoke to Assistant Library Director Anna Litton and found out that they are very busy indeed, adjusting and innovating to continue to serve the needs of their patrons. I began by asking about the new system for checking out books and other materials. So our contactless pickup system works well for anyone who has placed holds before. And of course, we are here to help anyone who has not used our hold system previously. Anyone in the community is welcome to go to the library catalog. You can access that through robinslibrary.org. Once you click in the catalog, you can find any book that you are interested in and request the title. Once you request that title, a long process is put into place where we are able to get that book for you either here from the Robbins Library or from one of the 40 plus members of the Minuteman Library Network. Um, when your book becomes available for you, uh, you receive a notice that your, your titles are ready and available and you go uh, back to the Robbins Library website to schedule your pickup with our contactless pickup booking tool. 
Um, it's a really simple tool to use. You select the time that you would like to pick that book up. We currently are offering pickup slots between 9.30 and 6.30, Mondays through Thursdays. Fridays, that's 9.30 to uh, 4.30. And then on Saturdays, right now, I'm speaking to you today on September 1st, and um, next week our uh, regular hours will start. So currently on Saturdays, you can only pick up between 9.30 and 11.30, but starting next week, it will be 9.30 through 4.30. So quite a few pickup options available for the week. You schedule your time, you walk up to the library's front door um, and books are labeled with um, a little labeling system that includes the last three letters, the first three letters of your last name, first initial and last four digits of your library card. You grab your books off the shelf and you're good to go. You are ready to go. So we started that system on June 22nd. We were so happy. Uh, it was a little bit, people were having a little bit of a wait to get their books at that stage as all of the libraries in the Minuteman Library Network were kind of gearing up for the service and that is working so smoothly for people right now. Well, that's a great example of how the library is changing its traditional processes to accommodate for the pandemic. I was also curious, however, about a brand new program I'd heard about, the Library Grab Bag. And here's what Anna had to say about that. So we wanted to bring that kind of feeling of finding something wonderful that maybe you didn't choose. We wanted to give parents the option to get just a lot of picture books without knowing the specific titles that we were looking for. We wanted to make a vacation bag for people who just like mysteries and don't really care which mysteries those are. So our library grab bag program works uh, via a form. So uh, you can go to our website. The library grab bag form is right there. Uh, patrons are asked a pretty basic and minimum number of questions. What kinds of materials are you looking for? First, you have to select which age category you're looking for, kids, teens, or adults. And then from there, you just ask a pretty, answer a pretty short list of questions. What kinds of materials are you interested in? Uh, tell us something that you liked. And librarians on staff go through the library and pull items that match your request. We schedule um, five grab bags go out every hour from the library, every one of those hours that we're open. And we frequently have, um, again, frequently all of those slots are taken. The grab bags have really depends on the kinds of books, but over 10, 20 more items per bag. <laughs> and um, one of my favorite things about the grab bag program, we call patrons to schedule the pickup for those. It's, those are not scheduled through that same yeah. contactless booking tool. So when your grab bag is ready, after you've filled out that form, submitted your form, the librarians read the forms, they assemble the bags, and you get a call. Your grab bag is ready. I'd like to schedule your pickup for you. And my favorite thing about this program is hearing, talking again to our patrons. Librarians miss patrons. We like talking to people. People are so happy with the service. Um, one of my, our staff members was just saying today, a uh, patron, she called a community member to say her bag was full. And the woman said, please don't ever discontinue this program. We love it so much. And it is just a great way to find books that maybe you didn't know that you wanted, uh, books that really are gonna keep those kids happy and keep those kids busy and really providing some fun and different things for you that you didn't know you were looking for. Curious about what else the library has planned for the near and longer term future? Just check out the full interview with Anna on our ACMI News Facebook page. And speaking of Anna, she now makes an encore appearance in this week's newscast. ACMI News correspondent Isabel Latourst caught up with Anna to talk about an interesting event coming up at the library next week. Today I'm here with Anna Litton, and she's going to tell me a little bit about the event this week at the library that um, is being hosted by the Robbins Library. So this week we are going to be hosting Andrew Giles Buckley, who's uh, made a fantastic film called Stefano, the true story of Shakespeare's shipwreck. Um, his crew, Hit and Run History, have produced this film about a person I really had known nothing about. Um, a man who was uh, had come to the New World um, on a ship that was shipwrecked and became the inspiration for the character of Stefano in the play The Tempest. 
10 years later, he was actually a passenger on the Mayflower. Um, I, his name is Stephen Hopkins. I had never heard of him before. And I think this story is just going to be a fascinating glimpse into a piece of history that we just knew nothing about. So we are so thankful to the Cultural Council to be providing these fantastic grants to uh, people who are bringing really unique pieces to the community. And during this period, during this COVID period, here at the library, I think we've been really um, honored to be able to support Cultural Council grants even when our building is closed. So this is the second Cultural Council grant that we've supported through uh, a Facebook Live event. Uh, we hosted an event back in June. Uh, we're looking forward to hosting this one, and we're just really happy to be able to continue to support uh, arts and culture events here in Arlington. So when is this event taking place? It's going to be taking place on Thursday, September 10th at 7 o'clock. There, we're going to be working actually with ACMI to screen the film. We'll have a live stream of the film, followed by a Q&A with the director. Okay, so how can people uh, find this link to get involved and watch the event? The whole piece, the whole live stream is going to be hosted on the library's uh, face stream live, Facebook live. You'll just have to anybody. You don't need to have a Facebook account. You can move to uh, the library's Facebook account, which is at um, facebook.com slash Robbins Library, A-R-L-N-A. -A. Um, and there you'll see the event right there, the Facebook Live event. Um, that will include a little bit of an introduction, the a link to the um, live stream of the film, and we'll be hosting the Q&A with the author, with the filmmaker right there on Facebook Live. You'll be able to ask your questions and hear the filmmaker speak about his project right there. That's great. Correct. Thank you so much. With very little fanfare, Alan Tosti recently decided to end his long tenure as chairman of our town's finance committee. You may not be aware of what this group does, but trust me, they have a big influence on how your tax dollars are spent. I have really enjoyed interacting with Al over my own years at ACMI, but I'm going to hand it back to Adam Chapdelaine to describe Al's impact on him and on the town. In all honesty, it I can only, I mean, I think of Al Tosti just about as fondly as I think of anyone that I've worked with in this community. He balances fiscal stewardship and a watchdog type eye on the town's budget with being a balanced, reasonable, and compassionate man. And I just, like, I can't say enough good things about Al. And I'm, I'm get, I didn't even anticipate this. I'm getting choked up thinking about it. He's just, I mean, he, we talk about the overrides that have passed. We talk about debt exclusions that the town has had passed, our long range plans, the way we've been able to invest in the school department and other town departments. And he doesn't always get the credit for this because in a lot of meetings, he plays the role of pushing back on spending. But at the end of the day, if you believe Arlington is a place with good fiscal stability, which I do, um, there's a lot of people who deserve thanks, but no one more than Al Tosti. He has dedicated so much time and so much effort for, for no reward on his own, right? Because he loves Arlington and cares about Arlington. And there is no question that Arlington is a better place for his service. And I think he is staying on the committee to serve as a, a backbencher, as he would describe it. But, um, and I'm excited to work with Charlie Foskett, who will be taking his place as chair of the Finance Committee. But I think Charlie, even Charlie knows, filling Al's shoes will be nearly impossible because of what Al's brought to this community over the, really, I think, almost 30 plus years of service to the town. We try to keep you abreast of all the latest news on our ACMI News Facebook page. And you can find this newscast and lots of other great content on our website at acmi.tv. Thanks for joining us for this week's newscast and have a great Labor Day weekend. Please take care of yourselves and each other. For ACMI News, I'm James Milan, and we'll see you next time. You can always check out our latest segments and newscasts on the web at acmi.tv news. And don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at ACMI News. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. You'll find us at youtube.com slash ACMI News. If you have any news tips for us or wish to become a citizen journalist, we'd love to hear from you. 
email us at news at acmi.tv or stop by ACMI Studio A at 85 Park Avenue. <laughs>